uh, sorry about uh, sorry about the delay. So I'm just gonna get started right away since it's already been delayed quite a bit. And once again, sorry about that. All right, so today's lecture is on metabolism. So I'm gonna be starting off with talking about uh, catabolism and ATP production. So what catabolism is, is uh, the, it's basically the breakdown of molecules and these molecules are oxidized to obtain energy, uh, which are then used in other pathways. Uh, an example of catabolism is fermentation, which is a catabolic pathway that degrades sugars down without the use of oxygen. And another example of catabolism is aerobic respiration, which is the most efficient, efficient cat catabolic pathway. And aerobic respiration uses oxygen to, to degrade sugars. And aerobic respiration is another type of catabolism, which is performed by some prokaryotes. And this uses a, another su a substance other than oxygen to replace oxygen as the reactant. Uh, and this can include carbon dioxide or nitrate, for example. Uh, cellular respiration refers to both anaerobic and aerobic processes, but it's usually used as a synonym for aerobic respiration. Uh, using cellular respiration, one mole of glucose or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules releases 686 kilocalories of energy when broken down. Usable energy is obtained by using the energy that glucose breakdown releases to bind with ADP with, with inorganic phosphate to form ATP, which can then be hydrolyzed easily by the cell to release energy. The transfer of electrons between two substances is what releases energy from organic molecules that are broken down, and this energy can then be used to generate ATP. Uh, electron transfers are call, called oxidation re reduction reactions or redox reactions. The loss of electrons from a substance is called oxidation, and the gain of electrons for that substance is called reduction. And likewise, a, redu a reducing agent is one that donates electrons to a substance, while an oxidizing agent accepts electrons. Redox reactions do not always have to involve the complete transfer of electrons, and instead they can involve changes in the sharing of electrons, which releases energy because electrons lose potential energy when shared unequally. Uh, specifically, in the case of aerobic respiration, the fuel or glucose is oxidized, while oxygen is reduced, and that leads to electrons losing potential energy and therefore a release of energy. Uh, so right here, we can see some examples of redox reactions, which are anaerobic respiration, or, or uh, my bad, which are two forms of aerobic respiration. Uh, in this case, we're using, we're using methane and oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy you can see that the methane becomes oxidized into carbon dioxide and the oxygen becomes reduced into uh, water. And that's the same case with uh, cell cellular respiration that uses glucose where the glucose becomes oxidized into carbon dioxide and the oxygen becomes reduced into water. And the energy that's, that's used is used to produce uh, ATP, which is this molecule right here. And ATP is used, can be used as usable energy. Uh, and this energy can be released by breaking these phosphate bonds in ATP. When these bonds are broken, they release a lot of energy that can be used for processes such as muscle movement or transport of substances throughout the cell. All right, next I'll be talking about uh, NAD plus and NADH. So cellular respiration breaks down glucose in a series of steps. Uh, electrons are taken from glucose and then transferred with, along with protons to nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And this coenzyme is used because it can easily switch between its oxidized form or NAD plus and its reduced form or NADH. And the re reduced form has two electrons that it can donate. Uh, and the way that it switches is that a dehydrogenase enzyme removes two hydrogen atoms from a substrate or glucose and then transfers these two the uh, transfers two electrons along with one proton to NAD+. And the other proton from the two hydrogen atoms is released into solution as, uh, as just a proton. Uh, NADH stores energy, which can then be used to generate ATP. So right here, you can see the reaction that I was talking about. Uh, you take uh, the NAD plus, 
you add uh, protons from glucose or other substances, and or you, you add hydrogen atoms from glu from glucose, uh, and then that is then inputted into the NAD plus to form NADH, and that releases a single proton along with the reduced form of NAD plus or NADH. All right, now we'll be talking about the first part of uh, cellular respiration, which is glycolysis. So glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of all types of cells, and it's the start of cellular respiration, and it oxidizes glucose into pyruvate. So glucose, which is a hexose sugar or a six carbon sugar, is split into two trioses or three carbon sugars. Uh, these three carbon sugars are glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or G3P and dihydroxyacetone phosphate or DHAP. Uh, and they're formed after covalent modification of the glucose and then the splitting of glucose. So the DHAP is rapidly converted to G3P um, and then the G3P is used to make pyruvate. So uh, the cell uses two molecules of ATP to add two phosphate groups to the six carbon sugar or of glucose so that it can be converted, which is the covalent modification that I was talking about. And there's a gain of a total of four ATP and two NADH by using the phosphates and hydrogen atoms from the three carbon sugars. And no carbon is released during glycolysis into CO2 and all of it is present in the pyruvate. So on the bottom right here, you can see a very detailed pathway of glycolysis that show all the enzymes. So you start by converting glucose into glucose 6-phosphate, and then glucose 6-phosphate is then converted into fructose 6-phosphate, which is an isomer of glucose. Uh, and then what you do with the glucose with the fructose 6-phosphate is you add another phosphate group to it. So it becomes fructose 1,6,5-bisphosphate. Uh, then you cleave that fructose into G3P and DHAP. And then DHAP is converted back into G3P. The two G3P molecules then go down in this pathway, which eventually converts them into pyruvate, releasing the ATP and the NADH molecules. All right, before I move on to the next part, I'll be talking about the basic structure of a mitochondria because that's necessary to understand the next part. So uh, right here is you have a mitochondria. Uh, the outside membrane is just called the outer membrane. Then we have another a second membrane on the inside, which is called the inner membrane. Uh, between The space between the two membranes is known as the intermembrane space. And the space inside the inner membrane is called the matrix. And the mitochondria has these folds called cristae, which help increase its surface area. And I'll be talking about that a bit more in detail in the next couple slides. Uh, you can see that mitochondria also have their own DNA and ribosomes, so they can produce their own proteins independent of this cell. All right, so now moving on to the citric acid cycle. So the citric acid cycle is, occurs when oxygen is present and pyruvate is oxidized in the mitochondria. And in aerobic prokaryotes, the pyruvate stays in the cytosol since these prokaryotes don't have mitochondria. So the pyruvate basically enters the mitochondria through active transport and then it's further oxidized. Uh, after entering the mitochondria, it's converted into acetyl coenzyme A by oxidation of the pyruvate and removal of a carboxyl group or COO minus. And then this carboxyl group is released as carbon dioxide. And after releasing the carbon dioxide, the remaining two carbon molecule of pyruvate is oxidized and the electrons from oxidation are transferred to NAD plus to store energy as NADH. And then uh, after that, you add a coenzyme A to the, the acetyl group that's produced and coenzyme A is just a B vitamin derivative. And then that generates the acetyl coenzyme A. So once you have the acetyl coenzyme A, it's used in this citric acid cycle pathway, which is used to generate three NADH from the oxidation of NAD+, one FADH2 from oxidizing FAD, which is an electron transporter sim similar to NADH, 
which accepts two electrons and two protons to become FADH2. And FAD is used instead of NAD plus in some parts of the citric acid cycle because the energy transferred in that particular part of the citric acid cycle uh, is not enough to generate uh, NADH. Uh, so this means that a total of six NADH, two FADH2, and two ATP are generated from one molecule of glucose. And you can see the reason that it's called a citric acid cycle is because the final molecule that it produces is also the same as the initial molecule that's used along with the acetyl coenzyme A to produce all of the NADH and FADH. So you start off with oxaloacetate, and then you combine that with acetyl coenzyme A, and then the combination of those two can produce citrate, or which is one of, which is uh, basically just citric acid without a hydrogen atom, and that's why it's called the citric acid cycle. Using citrate, you go to isocitrate, which is just an isomer of citrate, and that's done by just removing a water molecule and then adding another molecule, water molecule in the, in another place. From there, you form alpha ketoglutarate to a bunch of various car carbon molecules. And then by forming those carbon molecules, you, get, you can produce NADH. And then you finally get back to oxaloacetate, which can be used with another molecule of acetyl coenzyme A to restart the cycle all over again and produce more electron carrying molecules. All right, now I'll be going over uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So the oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the electron transport chain or the ETC, which are just interchangeable terms. So the electron transport chain is a collection of molecules that are embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria in eukaryotes and in the plasma membrane in prokaryotes. And the, the electron transport chain is just used to power ATP synthesis. So the inner membrane of the mitochondria has the folds or the cristae that I was talking about. And like I said, the folds uh, increase the surface area and increasing the surface area of the mitochondria, the mitochondrial membrane allows uh, thousands of individual electron transport chains to exist in a single mitochondrion. And the components that make up the electron transport chain are protein complexes numbered one through four. Prosthetic groups, which are cofactors and coenzymes that are essential for function, bind to these complexes. And during electron transport, the carriers in the electron transport chain alternate between reduced and oxidized forms while they accept and donate electrons. Electrons move to lower free energy states as they travel through the transport chain, which releases usable energy. And electrons from NADH are transferred to flavoprotein in complex one, then to an iron sulfur protein, and then to ubiquinone, which is a small hydrophobic coenzyme that's the only non-protein member of the electron transport chain. Uh, and then after that, almost all the remaining proteins in the complexes are cytochromes, which are these molecules with uh, prosthetic heme groups that donate and, elect and accept electrons using an iron atom in the center. And you can see the heme groups that are involved in the process right here. This, uh, so, uh, it's got an iron atom in the center, which accepts or donates the electrons. And it's surrounded by nitrogen atoms and a, a bunch of various other, other, other um, atoms. And that heme group is embedded in the cytochromes. So in addition to uh, the heme groups, there's also a couple more iron sulfur proteins and the other complexes of the electron transport chain. So in, in addition to complex one, complexes two and three also have iron sulfur proteins. And the final cytochrome, uh, which is in, located in complex four, passes two electrons to oxygen. And then along with the two, the two electrons, oxygen also picks up two hydrogen ions from solution. And it combines with the hydrogen ions and electrons to form water, which is released as one of the products of uh, respiration. So this is all made possible by the electron carriers FADH2 and NADH, which were produced in the Krebs cycle. And then they shuttle the electrons from the Krebs cycle to the electron transport chain. So FADH2 donates electrons at a lower energy level than NADH uh, because it also is produced at a lower energy level, like I mentioned before. 
So although both molecules donate the same number of electrons, NADH generates more ATP. Uh, and NADH specifically generates 2.5 ATP versus FADH uh, generates 1.5 ATP. Uh, the electron transport chain itself generates no ATP directly, and instead ATP is generated via chemiosmosis. As the electron cha transport chain shuttles electrons, uh, it also it pumps protons from the matrix to the inner membrane space. And then the pumping of protons into the inner membrane space creates a, an, a proton gradient that's exploited by the protein ATP synthase to generate ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Uh, in prokaryotes, the proton gradient created across the cell membrane is used to generate ATP and to move, uh, and to move flagella and pump wastes and nutrients across the membrane. So right here, you can see uh, images of the electron transport chain with the different complexes, uh, protein complex one, protein complex two, the protein ubiquinone, which floats inside the membrane, uh, protein complexes, complex three and four. And then after transporting the electrons to oxygen, you can see that there's an ATP synthase, which uses the hydrogen ions uh, pumped by the electron transport chain to generate ATP. And the way ATP synthase does this is it's kind of like a, a motor. So uh, hydrogen uh, proton, uh, protons flow through to the other side. And as they flow through, this turns the ATP synthase and the mechanical motion of the turning is used to force ADP and the inorganic phosphate molecule together to form ATP. All right, this is just a summary of the ATP that's produced in aerobic respiratory glycolysis, which produces 2 NADH and 2 ATP. And then after glycolysis, you oxidize pyruvate to produce uh, more NADH and FADH. And then that then also, and the citric acid cycle that goes to the citric acid cycle, which uh, produces some ATP. And then the NADH and FADH produced in the citric acid cycle is used in oxidative phosphorylation, which produces around 26 to 28 ATP. And this just depends on which electron, sh which, which, uh, electron shuttle, whether it's NADH or FADH, transports electrons to the, uh, the, to the cytosol. Uh, and then this results in a total of about 32 to 30 to 32 ATP in total, which is quite a bit. All right, now I'll be moving on to photosynthesis. So uh, photosynthesis, uh, as most of you will probably know, occurs in chloroplasts. And chloroplasts are found in the mesophyll cells of leaves, which make up tissue that is found in the interior of, the, of a leaf. And the, these mesophyll cells have about 30 to 40. 40 chloroplasts, which measure about two to four microns or micrometers by four to seven mi microns. Uh, chloroplasts themselves have two membranes, just like the mitochondria, that surround a thick fluid, which is the stroma. And inside the stroma, there's a third membrane system, which is, called, which is made up of sacs called the thylakoids. And chlorophyll is located inside the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplasts. The general formula for photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water to a sugar or a carbohydrate molecule plus oxygen. And like I said, the, the, carbo the carbohydrate is molecule can be, is just any type of sugar, which can then be converted into glucose after multiple cycles of the photosynthesis reaction. And likewise, right here, you can see that photosynthesis like uh, cellular respiration is a Resurrection dioxide becomes reduced into a sugar and the water becomes oxidized into oxygen. So first I'll be talking about the light dependent reactions which occur first during photosynthesis. So in the light dependent reactions, chlorophyll uses pigments to absorb light. And these two pigments are chlorophyll A 
which participates directly in the light reactions and absorbs violet, blue, and red light the best, and chlorophyll B and carotenoids, which help extend the absorbance spectrum that work in light reactions. So these extra two accessory pigments are just used so that uh, plant cells can absorb more wavelengths of light and thus perform photosynthesis better. And then uh, carotenoids uh, also absorb and dis dissipate excess light and energy, which can damage chlorophyll uh, by interacting with oxygen in the chloroplasts to form harmful oxidative ox agents. So the carotenoids prevent that and help photosynthesis function normally. So uh, this whole process starts with absorption of a, photo of a photon from light by chlorophyll, which elevates an electron in chlorophyll to a higher energy state. And that leaves the chlorophyll molecule in an excited state. Uh, in the thylakoid membrane, chlorophyll and other molecules are organized into photos photosystems. And when light excites a pigment molecule in photosystem two, the energy from that pigment is that is excited uh, is transferred to other pigment molecules and eventually to a pair of chlorophyll molecules, which are called P680. And this pair of chlorophyll molecules uses the energy to excite one of their electrons to a higher energy level, which is then captured by a primary electron acceptor, which becomes reduced. And then an enzyme in the photosystem splits water into an oxygen atom and hydrogen atoms. And the electrons of the hydrogen atoms are used to restore the lost electron from P680, while the protons are released into the thylakoid space. And the oxygen atom combines with another to form, to form an oxygen molecule, which is released as part of one of the products of photosynthesis. Uh, electrons pass from the primary electron acceptor of photosystem two to photosystem one using an electron transport chain. And this chain is made up of an elect electron carrier plastoquinone or PQ, uh, a cytochrome complex and a protein called plastocyanin or PC. So free energy that's released during the transfer of electrons is used to pump protons into the thylakoid space, creating a proton gradient like in uh, cellular respiration. And just like cellular respiration, this proton gradient is used to synthesize ATP using ATP synthase. Uh, and in the meantime, while the ATP synthase is producing ADP, uh, PS photosystem one has lost an electron from its own pair of chlorophyll molecules, which is called P700 as opposed to P680. And then this pair of uh, this electron that's lost is uh, then transferred to the primary electron acceptor of photosystem one. And the electron from photosystem two is used to replenish the electron of the chlorophyll pair in photosystem one. Uh, electrons from photosystem one are passed uh, down a second electron transport chain, which contains ferredoxin. And this doesn't create a proton gradient, or a, a, a proton gradient. Uh, sorry, I believe it says protein gradient there, it's supposed to say proton. Uh, the enzyme NAD plus reductase recatalyzes the transfer of electrons from ferredoxin to uh, NAD plus, which is an electron carrier with the same structure structural function as NAD structure and function as NAD plus with the exception of an added phosphate group. So NAD plus is used instead of NAD plus. NADP plus is used instead of NAD plus as it makes it easier for the cell to regulate more both of the molecules independently. So the plant cell can regulate NAD plus for uh, photosynthesis and NAD plus for cellular respiration so that the two processes don't like mix with each other. And Two electrons are used to synthesize NADPH from NAD+, in addition to the removal of a proton from the stroma. So as you can see, this process just produces uh, the NAD, NADPH and ATP, which is used in the Kelvin cycle, or also known as the dark reaction to perform to produce sugars. Uh, right here, you can see uh, the absorption spectrums of carotenoids, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So these all peak at certain wavelengths of light. And you can see that adding chlor chlorophyll A peaks at this particular, these particular wavelengths of red and blue violet. So the addition of chlorophyll B and the carotenoids help extend the peaks, the total amount of, uh, the total wavelength at which the chlorophyll peaks, and thus the total amount of wavelength at which uh, the chlorophyll can be excited and uh, release electrons.
And right here, you can see how the photo system works, which, and it has a, a, what happens is that a photon excites chlorophyll, which uh, then releases an electron and the electrons kind of hop from chlorophyll to chlorophyll until they release, they reach the uh, P680 or P700, depending on what photo system you're in. And then that then transfers electrons to a primary electron trans acceptor, which goes on to transfer electrons and produce uh, NADH and ATP through indirect methods. Uh, right here, you can see a basic, a more visual representation of the light dependent reactions. You start off, once again, you start off with light, uh, exciting the chlorophyll molecules, releasing electrons. Uh, electrons are then uh, go uh, from the chlorophylls, then go along this electron transport chain, and they get replenished by photosystem one. Eventually, they combine with NAD plus and a proton to produce NADPH, which is used in the Kelvin cycle. And meanwhile, uh, the electrons that are lost in the original photosystem two are replenished by the splitting of water into protons and oxygen. Oxygen is released as a product while the protons are pumped uh, into the outside. Uh, the, proton create, the protons create a gradient which are pumped into the outside and that allows ATP synthase to uh, synthesize ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. And that ATP is also used in the Kelvin cycle, which I'll then be talking about next. All right, last slide, which is the Kelvin cycle. So the Kelvin cycle produces the three carbon carbohydrate G3P, which you may remember from a cellular respiration. And the production of one molecule of G3P requires three cycles of the Kelvin cycle. So the cycle uses, NA, it uses ATP as an energy source and NADPH to add electrons to the carbon to the carbon compounds to produce sugars. So you start off the cycle by attaching carbon dioxide to a five carbon sugar, uh, which is ribulose bi biphosphate or uh, RUBP uh, using the enzyme. And this is done using the enzyme RUBP carboxylates or oxygenase or Rubisco. And this is the most abundant protein in plants and most likely the most abundant protein on earth, which is quite interesting. Uh, the six carbon intermediate that's formed by attaching carbon, the one carbon carbon dioxide to the five carbon sugar is unstable. So it splits into two molecules of three phosphoglycerate. Uh, and then the three phosphoglycerate molecule receives a phosphate from the ATP produced in the light reactions and it then becomes one three bisphosphoglycerate. Uh, two electrons donated from the NADPH produced in the light reactions reduce the 1,3 BPG or bisphosphoglycerate. And this also causes it to lose a phosphate group. And then it then becomes glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And then electrons reduce a carboxyl group on the 1,3 BPG to the aldehyde group of G3P, which causes the molecule to have more potential energy, which is good since you want sugars to be able to store more energy. So for every three molecules of carbon dioxide that enter the cycle, six molecules of G3P are formed, but five of those G3P molecules are required to regenerate the ribulose, bisphosphate, and the other molecules that are used in the cycle. So one molecule exits the cycle, and then it's used by the plant to produce hexoses, or such as glucose in the cytosol. And like I said, the remaining five G3P molecules are rearranged by the Calvin cycle into three uh, RUBP molecules, which use three ATP to do this. And this allows the RUBP to accept carbon dioxide again. So a total of any, a nine and ATP and six NADPH molecules are used to generate one G3P molecules. And therefore uh, 18 ATP and 12 NADPH are required to generate one glucose molecule. And that's pretty much the end of the lecture. Uh, I see there's a message in the chat and we'll see what that's about. And then I'll uh, start a little uh, quiz on the lecture. All right, so I have a good question, uh, which is that uh, 
could you explain why uh, NADH generates more ATP than uh, FADH? So I'll go back to that slide and answer that. All right, so basically the reason for that is uh, you have to go back to the citric acid cycle. So uh, during the citric acid cycle, the reason we use uh, FADH in one of the steps instead of NADH uh, is because the per in the particular step of the citric acid cycle that generates FADH, uh, the energy that's produced from uh, uh, reducing our carbon is not enough to generate uh, NADH. And so instead we use uh, FAD, uh, FAD to create FADH because it requires a lot less energy to generate FADH than NADH. And as a, as a result of generating FADH instead of NADH at a lower energy level, when you turn the FADH back into FAD in the electron transport chain, uh, there's a lot less energy that can be released and therefore less ATP is produced because less energy means less ATP. Yeah, thank you for the question. That was a good question. All right, uh, if, no, if there are no other questions, uh, I'll wait for a couple seconds to see if anyone else has any other questions. And if not, I'll start a short, very short quiz. All right, looks like there's no other questions, so I'll just start the quiz. All right, uh, you can go to menti.com and use the following code to start. All right, uh, is anyone still joining or trying to join? Yeah, I'm still trying to join. All right, cool. I'll wait for a couple more seconds. Yeah, my internet is kind of bad. Because... Oh, that's, a, that's okay. Uh, I'll wait for a couple minutes then. All right, see a couple more people have joined. So uh, is that everyone? All right, there's uh, nobody else that wants to join then, I guess uh, I can start now.
All right, yeah, most people got this correct. This is NADH because uh, NADH has the, is the uh, produced form with the electrons of NAD+. So uh, with the electrons, uh, it can then donate those electrons to these other molecules to produce the products that are shown right here. Uh, it's not NAD+, because that does not have electrons, and that is, that's the molecule without the electrons. All right, uh, so I can see once again, a majority of people got this question right, which is great. Uh, it was a bit challenging though, so I'll go over it. So uh, basically uh, what's going on here is that talking about the electron transport chain, which has complexes numbered one, two, three, four, and electrons go down the transport chain in the order of complex one to complex two, to complex three, to complex four, to oxygen. So if you block the, uh, cytochrome oxidase in complex four that prevents electrons from being transported to oxygen and oxygen from becoming reduced. So uh, the, these answers are incorrect because these are all components of the electron chain transport chain that come before the complex four electron acceptor. So uh, lava protein is present in complex one the iron sulfur proteins are present in complexes one, two, and three. And the cytochromes uh, is wrong because it comes before the final electron acceptor of complex four. So the only molecule that accepts electrons after complex four is oxygen. And that's why it's called the final electron acceptor in the context of the electron transport chain. All right, uh, so this one was just a little bit of math. Uh, hopefully my math is correct on this, but uh, it's 2.5 ATP per NADH and uh, 1.5 ATP per FADH2. So 2.5 times four is uh, 10 and 1.5 times six is uh, nine. So you sum those up to get 19 and that's a total of 19 ATP. And that's pretty much it. So I guess I'll reveal the winners. All right, uh, congratulations to everyone. And Joshua, I guess, for scoring the best on this. Uh, and yeah, thank you all for coming to this meeting and participating, uh, asking questions. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to ask them right now. But if not, that's the end of this. And y'all can go now. Uh, where, will the, uh, where will the recording be posted? Uh, that'll be posted in our Discord. Uh, do you have the link? Are you in our Discord or do you need the link? No, uh, no I'm not. Okay, yeah, let me uh, send the link to our Discord now. Okay, thank you.